Welcome back, listeners, to Sandman Stories Presents, a folklore podcast where I read you to sleep or until the next story. I'm your host, Dustin. Today we are back in the book of Azorian Folklore, written down by Elsie Spicer Eels. In the first story, a tween king tries to kill the girl he is fated to marry. And in the second one, we get what could be a distant cousin of Snow White. Okay, let's begin. Story number one. Story number one. Maria of the Forest. The story of a king and his fate. Once upon a time, there was a very young king who went into the deep forest on a hunting expedition. He and his favorite page became separated from the rest of the party and soon realized that they were lost. As night approached, they found a rude hut of a charcoal burner and begged permission to pass the night there. They were received most hospitably. Just at the hour of midnight, the king was awakened from his sleep by a voice. This is what it said. Here in this hut is born tonight, the maiden of your fate. You can't escape your lot, young king. Your fate for you will wait. Tis fate, tis fate, tis fate. The king turned over in his pillow and tried to sleep, but the strange voice kept ringing in his ears. He rose early. As soon as he saw the charcoal burner, the man said, A baby daughter was born to me last night. At what time? asked the king. It was just midnight, replied the charcoal burner. The king awakened his page and told him what had happened. I refuse to wed any maid born in this poor hut, he said. You must help me to escape this fate. Oh, what can I do about it? asked the page, yawning. You must steal this babe this very day and put it to death, said the king sternly. The page did not dare refuse and easily obtained possession of the baby when no one was looking. He carried her away into the deep forest, but he did not have the heart to put the innocent babe to death. He left her in a hollow tree, wrapped up with the bright red sash he wore. When he returned to the king, he confessed that he had been too tender-hearted to slay the baby. The king was angry. Take me to the baby, he said. I'll do the deed myself. Though they searched long and faithfully, they were unable to find the hollow tree where the baby had been left. They, of course, did not wish to return to the hut of the charcoal burner, and at length they found their way out of the deep forest. No one will ever discover that baby if I myself could not find it. She will die soon without food, said the page. The king agreed that it was quite impossible for the babe to escape death but he could not forget that strange voice which had said, Here in this hut is born tonight, the maiden of your fate. You can't escape your lot, young king. Your fate for you will wait. Tis fate, tis fate, tis fate. Now it happened that very day a woodcutter was working in the forest. Suddenly he heard what sounded like the cry of a baby. There can't be a child here in the deep forest, he said to himself, and went on to his work. The cry continued, however, and it sounded very near, almost under the woodcutter's feet. He looked into a hollow log, and there he found a dimpled baby girl, wrapped in a bright red sash. Poor little thing, her own mother has abandoned her. My good wife will be a mother to her, he said. The woodcutter's wife had no children of her own, and received the baby gladly. She named her Maria of the Forest. As the days flew by and the babe thrived under her care, she could not have loved her more than she had been her own child. The weeks and months passed and soon little Maria of the Forest had grown into a lovely girl. Her kind foster mother made a bonnet for her out of the bright red sash, which she had found wrapped about her the first time she saw her. It made Maria's dark eyes look even brighter than before. Now it happened that the king and his page were again hunting in the forest, and passed by the house of the woodcutter. The page noticed the pretty little girl, and saw the red bonnet she wore. He called her to him and examined it carefully. There can be no doubt that this is the material from my own red sash, he confessed to the king. This woodcutter's daughter could have such a bonnet as this in no other way. The king ordered him to make inquiries about the child, and soon the page found out that the little maid was in truth the baby he had left in the hollow tree. 
the king ordered him again to steal her. This time the king plotted her death by drowning. He had a box made for her, put her in it, and threw her into the sea with his own hand. I refuse to wed any girl brought up in a woodcutter's hut, he raged. I'll escape that fate. Nevertheless, he could not escape the memory of the strange voice which had said, Here in this hut is born tonight, the maiden of your fate. You can't escape your lot, young king. Your fate for you will wait. Tis fate, tis fate, tis fate. It was most annoying to remember it. It happened soon after that a ship encountered the box floating upon the sea. The sailors rescued it and opened it with interest. Inside, they were surprised to find a pretty dark-eyed girl with a bright red bonnet on her head. She could not tell them where she had come from, but said her name was Maria of the Forest. When the sailors arrived in their own country, they told the story of finding the child, and the king asked to see her. He and the king were so pleased with her lovely face and gentle manners that they received her into the royal palace. She was brought up as a lady of waiting to their very own little daughter about the same age. When, after a dozen years, the princess was wedded, all the kings of nearby countries were invited to the marriage feast. The king who had been lost in the forest came with the others. At the feast, there was no one more beautiful than Maria of the forest. The king danced with her. Who is the girl? was his eager question. She has been reared in the royal palace as if she were in truth the sister of the bride, was the reply. The king fell in love with the beautiful maid and gave her a ring. The page, however, was suspicious when he heard her name. He lost no time in making inquiries about her. What he found out made him very sure that she was in truth the daughter of the charcoal burner. He reported his suspicions to the king. Never mind, said the king. I'll wed the maid anyway. One can't escape one's fate. The End Okay, and story number two. The Seven Enchanted Princes The Story of How Honoria Kept Her Promise Long ago there was a little maid who lived all alone with her grandmother. They were very poor. The girl's name was Honoria. One day the grandmother sent the girl out to sell some of the oranges from their orange tree. You must bring home at least three vintens to me, she said. Don't dare return without at least that small amount of money. Honoria went from door to door trying to sell the oranges. Everyone seemed to have plenty of them that day. There was nobody who would purchase a single one. She walked on and on through town, everywhere obtaining the same answer. We do not wish to purchase any oranges today. Finally she found herself outside the town and in the forest. There was a house with a door wide open and on the table in front of the door lay three vintens. There was no one in sight and nobody answered Honoria's knock at the door. I'll take the money and leave some oranges in place of it, said Honoria. That will not be stealing. Accordingly, she selected some of the largest and finest of her oranges and placed them on the table. She put the money away carefully to take to her grandmother. Then she turned to leave, but found that the door was closed. She tried her best to open it, but she could not. Neither could she open any of the windows to climb out by that means. The windows were all fastened just as securely as the door. What shall I do? cried the girl, who was now thoroughly frightened. She did not like the idea of remaining a prisoner in a house in the forest. All day she tried to find some way of escape, but there seemed to be nothing to do except to wait until somebody came to her aid. This house is not far from the city. Surely someone will be passing this way and will come and help me to get out, said Honoria. I hope they'll come before night. There was nothing to eat in the house, and she was thankful enough for the big basket full of juicy oranges. At last it grew dark. Then Honoria heard footsteps outside the house. She could not see who was coming, but a key was turned in the lock and someone entered. 
She was so frightened that she hid under the table. The lit candles showed that the seven dwarfs had entered the house. They had brought food with them, and they at once went to work to prepare their evening meal. Who left us all these fine oranges? asked one of the dwarfs. I do not know, replied another. Someone has surely been here, and it must have been a kind friend. Honoria was almost tempted to crawl out from under the table and show herself, but she decided that it would be better to stay where she was and go home the next day when it was light. When morning came, however, she found out that she had been sleeping so soundly that she had not heard the seven dwarves when they left the house. The door was fastened just as securely as before. Honoria looked about the house and saw that there was enough work to keep her busy all day. There were dishes to wash and floors to sweep and beds to make. Fortunately, the dwarfs had left plenty of food. When night came, she heard footsteps approaching and again hid under the table. As soon as the seven dwarfs came into the house, they saw that it had been changed wonderfully during their absence. Our dishes are all washed, cried one of the dwarfs. Last night we forgot to wash them after supper. Our beds are all made, cried another. We left home so early this morning, we did not have time to make them. Our floors are all swept and everything is in order, cried another. We have never looked so neat and clean. Someone must have been here, said one of the dwarfs. It is surely a kind friend, said another. Perhaps they are here yet, cried another. If they are men, we will treat them like brothers, and if they are women, we will treat them like sisters, said the seventh dwarf, who had not spoken before. He had been looking around the house carefully, but he had seen no one. Honoria crawled out from under the table. The dwarfs joined hands and danced around her in a circle. We have a big sister now, they cried. A big sister to take care of us. Honoria knew that if she said anything about leaving, the dwarfs would be heartbroken. She knew, too, that her grandmother would give her a terrible beating for staying away from home for so long. The easiest thing seemed to be to remain in the forest and keep house for the seven dwarfs. Weeks and months went by, and Honoria led a happy life in the forest. The dwarfs brought home plenty of delicious food, and they also brought her the prettiest dresses she had ever seen. They were green like the moss and the leaves of the forest and brown like the rich earth about the house. There was a little hat with red berries upon it, which Honoria thought was the most charming hat in the world. She tried it on and ran to the brook to look at her reflection, for there was not a single mirror in the house. One day the king passed by with his gay hunting party. That day Honoria had on the prettiest moss green dress, and the king thought her the loveliest maiden he had ever seen. He stopped to chat with her. Do you live here in the forest all alone? he asked. No, I keep house for my seven brothers, was Honoria's answer. What a lovely little housekeeper, cried the king. Marry me and come to live in the royal palace. I must first ask my brothers, responded Honoria. I will tell you what they say tomorrow. That night when the seven dwarfs came home, Honoria told them about her visit from the king. How can we spare our big sister? cried one of the dwarfs. Who will keep house for us when she goes away? cried another. Who will make the beds so nicely? asked another. Who will sweep our floors? Who will wash our dishes? Who will sew on our buttons? I have known that our big sister would marry some time, said the seventh dwarf, who had not spoken, but had been thinking quietly. Why shouldn't she marry the king? We must let her marry the king. We must not be selfish, cried all the dwarfs together. They decided that Honoria should marry the king but they asked her not to let him kiss her until he had first said these words. By permission of the seven enchanted princes. He would have to remember it without being reminded by Honoria. Honoria told the king what her brothers had said, and the wedding was celebrated with great joy. When the king tried to kiss Honoria, she burst into tears. He had forgotten all about saying, By permission of the seven enchanted princes. Honoria would not let the king kiss her, and she cried so much and struggled so hard that the king thought she had gone crazy. He ordered her shut up in a dark cell underneath the palace. Then he married a new queen. Now it happened that there was a faithful servant who was quite sure that Honoria was not crazy. 
When Honoria told her of the words the king must say before he kissed her, this servant tried to think of some way to help her. She was in fact very angry at the fact that there was a new queen. One day she went to the queen and said, Queen Honoria, who is shut up in the dark cell underneath the palace, is much more clever than you are. What does Queen Honoria do that is so clever? asked the new queen. Queen Honoria will take a sword and cut off her head. Then she will put it back on again so that it is as good as new. I don't believe you are clever enough to do that. I've never tried it, answered the new queen. But just to show you that I'm as clever as Queen Honoria, I'll do it. With these words, she seized a sword and cut off her head. Of course, she fell dead immediately. The king married a new queen. Then the servant went to the new queen and said, Queen Honoria, who is shut up in the dark cell underneath the palace, is more clever than you are. The new queen was indignant at this remark. Why is she more clever than I am? she asked. What can she do that I can't do? She can take a sword and cut off her hand, and then she'll stick the hand on, and it will be as good as new. I've never tried it, but I'll do it just to convince you that I'm clever too, said this new queen. She took up a sword and cut off her right hand. Then she fainted away. The arm grew full of poison and the queen soon died, but not until she had told the king what the servant had said to her. The king was very angry at the servant and called her to him. What do you mean, he thundered, by telling such a story about Queen Honoria's magic powers? I wanted you to remember where you had found Queen Honoria, replied the servant. Then the king suddenly had remembered how he had first seen Queen Honoria when she was in the house in the forest. He had thought of how pretty she had looked in the dress which looked like soft green moss. Then he had thought of how she had said she must ask permission of her seven brothers before she consented to become his queen. By permission of the seven enchanted princes, he cried. I forgot to say these words when I kissed my dear Queen Honoria. He quickly ran to the dark cell underneath the palace where she was confined. He said the magic words and kissed his fair queen, who was just as beautiful as before she had been shut up in the cell, though a trifle paler. In the house of the forest the seven dwarfs, who were in truth seven enchanted princes, were suddenly disenchanted. Our sister Honoria did not forget us after all, they cried in joy. The End Wow, those were some fun and interesting stories. I felt bad for Maria in the first story, as she was fated to marry this older guy who tried to kill her several times. I made him into a child himself, just so that the age gap wouldn't be so icky. And then in the second one, I really like the character of Honoria. She does everything the right way and still has a tough life. It really gave me some Snow White vibes. This could be a fun movie if someone wanted to remix Snow White. And the podcast shout-out is to the Gochujang Gang, four Korean Americans who give insight into Korean culture and media while still being very American. It's a great mix of friends who love to chat and, if nothing else, check out their original intros. They have been doing this for a while and have a dedicated following. And so if you like their show as much as I do, go and give them a rating and a review and five stars on the podcast player of your choice. And the listener shout-out is to Arlington, Texas will count for 2% of my listeners from the Lone Star State. Arlington is a city in Texas, west of Dallas. It's home to the University of Texas at Arlington, UTA, whose campus has a modern planetarium. In River Legacy Parks, trails cut through the hardwood forest rich in wildlife. The park also has the River Legacy Living Science Center with aquariums, terrariums, and interactive exhibits. Some football team plays at the AT&T Stadium, which also hosts concerts according to Google. And the language I'm using today is of the Tonkawa people of Texas and Oklahoma. The resources are very light and didn't have a word for thank you in their dictionary. And so to my listeners, I say, Kes, Hayon, Enok, and Soyata. Good evening, and go swimming. <laughs>